created. I don't know about you, but to me, I'll be very disappointed, hurt, maybe even angry at that person. Beneath the political correctness of tolerance to refrain from a negative action lies an attitude of indifference. Our hearts that lack passion, love, compassion. Christians are not commanded to tolerate, are we? What are we commanded to do? Anybody? We're commanded to love. That's right. Bible does not say tolerate your brothers. No, it says to love your brothers. Not only your brothers, your enemies too. We are to love. We are people full of love. Even though someone may hold a view that's different from ours, we are commanded to love them and give them the good news of Jesus Christ and the love of Jesus Christ. This is the Christian difference. You know, the world argues that all world religions are basically fundamentally the same and superficially different. And, and I'm telling you, it's the other way around. The world religion is fundamentally different and superficially similar. Now, the world will take something like the golden rule. You shall love your neighbor as you would have them love you and say, hey, that golden rule applies for all religions. This is actually not the case. If you look at the world, let's say Buddhism, what it does say is don't do unto others what you wouldn't want them to do to you. Do you see the difference there? Do you catch the difference? It's the same concept as tolerance. Don't do to somebody what you wouldn't have them do to you. It's the message of don't do the negative. It is not a positive message, but it's the message to do, not do the negative. Of course, not doing something hateful is better than doing something bad. Yeah, that's true. But it does not resolve the fundamental problem of hate in the heart. It doesn't get rid of it. It just puts makeup on it. You're just not doing something about it, that's all. It creates a cold and indifferent heart, a heart of separation. You're building walls. You're drawing lines in the sand. This is not the Christian way. And we see it all the time. You know, people have YouTube those things on all the time. If somebody are getting wrong, let's say getting beat up on the street or something, you know, the old America that I know, everyone would, would jump in and would help. We would fight the good, uh, we would fight for the cause, for the goodness. We would not idly stand by and say, okay, I'm going to tolerate that. I'm just going to go my way. But if you see people these days, that's what they're doing. Instead of going and help, what they do? Let me take out my phone. <laughs> Let me record this thing. It's this heart of indifference that's creating a society of a cold heart. This message that it's okay to just tolerate people around us, to be indifferent, to look the other way, this is the temptation of tolerance that must be avoided and overcome. Secondly, let's talk about the tolerance towards morality. First, we talked about the tolerance towards people. We are living at a time where people believe that trust is relative. In fact, that nothing is really true, really good or bad. Everything is relative. They argue that cancerous cells are bad because it kills humans, but human white cells are bad because it kills cancerous cells. They argue that everything is relative, pending your perspective. You know, this seems absurd, but at the same time, you know, quirky, kind of a strange way, it kind of makes sense too, in a particular, you know, peculiar way. And we're just kind of, is that really true? It doesn't seem right, but the logic seems right. You know, the world 
with his this philosophical stances of relativism and false logic is confusing the minds of our young ones and maybe not so young ones. <laughs> now, C.S. Lewis in his book, The Pilgrim's Regress, brilliantly helps us identify and overcome false logic. In the book, the main character is really tired from a long journey going up and down the mountains. And then a waiter serves him a cool, uh, come on in. James, can you get a couple of more chairs? Okay. So in this, in this book, this, this uh, person is served cold, refreshing milk. And the character in the story uh, remarks on how refreshing and nutritious this glass of milk was. And then what happened? The waiter comes around and remarks that, hey, milk is a secretion from a cow, just as other secretions from the cow. It's the same secretion. I don't know why you're thinking it's, it's good. Now, the main character in the story is getting nauseated and, and, and is about to vomit. And at that moment, what it says is his logic came to rescue him. And it said, hey, wait, he lies. Don't let him fool you with this false logic. One kind of secretion was meant for nutrition, while the other was meant for waste. How are these the same? You know, the world with its wits and clever logic is a master of false logic. It masterfully justifies sin and disguises the wrong to be, well, not so wrong. It's all in the perspective. If you just look at it from that angle, hey, you'll see it's not that wrong. You know, in a debate where atheistic professor argued that that there's no such thing as right and wrong. All, all people are all relative. The Christian apologist said something like this. Well, if you want to experience the difference, just drive to the bad part of the neighborhood in your town and just take a walk at two in the morning. You will definitely know what's good and what's bad. You'll be able to experience it in your life. Today, people are correcting wrong behavior with other wrong behavior. People have no idea what the right behavior is anymore because they're confused. They're living in this relative state. Unless there is an objective point of reference for morality, there is no way to condemn anything. You know, when we look at something and say, hey, that's bad. That's truly bad. Unless there is a something solid, absolute thing you could point to and say, hey, that tells me that that's wrong. Unless you have this point of reference, everything becomes relative. But you cannot have an absolute morality, absolute point of reference, something that doesn't change without absolute law. And you cannot have an absolute law unless you have an absolute lawgiver. When people want to deny God at all costs, everything must become relative. Because they want to deny the absolute lawgiver, they have to deny the absolute law and say everything is relative. And that's what's happening in the world today. But what's worse than this is Satan doesn't even have to get us to absolute relativism. He just sells us the idea of absolute tolerance and gets people to just be indifferent to the truth and just not care whether something is right or wrong or good or evil. People see evil, but they refuse to call it evil. They see something that's bad but they refuse to say something that's bad because the moment they say that, they're going to be labeled intolerant people. And they are going to be crucified for that. People are no longer moved to do anything about sin. We become used to it. Us Christians, we become 
comfortable around it. And we no longer try to discern it. In high school, you have a lot of friends. You go to school, and life is life. There's no Christian, non-Christian, just friends. You don't label your you know, friends, Christian friend, non-Christian. I mean, friends are friends. And what you guys discuss, what you guys talk about, what you have in common interest, everything is basically the same in this one big melting pot of things. And we lose the discernment little by little. We become more tolerant. Hey, actually, he shouldn't be saying that. I'm, I'm, I'm not really comfortable with that, but, you know, I'll tolerate it. I'll let it go. And what happens after a little while? You get used to it. And you, you find yourself making the same jokes, saying the same thing as, as, as they're saying, because you become conditioned to it now. We are living in the last days, not because humans are getting worse, that we're getting more sinful. No, humans were always sinful. The difference is we no longer call sin, sin. We no longer say something bad is something bad. We justify everything and we say everything should be tolerated now. The world is becoming sinful. When it becomes to morality, we do not make the standard, do we? Relativism, we do. It is what it is. If you think it's good, it's good. If you think it's bad, it's bad. But we as Christians, we know we are not the lawmakers. We don't make the standard. We follow and obey the standard of God. That's who we are. We must, it says today, if we could get that up again. We must hate what is evil. We must not turn a blind eye. We cannot embrace evil and say, it's okay. But I share this message with caution because there's a real possibility that when I say this, that people may misunderstand and in their value and effort to hate evil may start hating people that are evil. You know, the Bible tells us, hey, I'm telling you to hate the evil, but not hate people that are evil. Otherwise, like I said last week, we would have to hate everyone, including ourselves, because we are all evil. When today's message talk about not hating evil, what is it exactly talking about? If we read the scripture today, before and after hate what is evil is love must be sincere and cling to what is good, right? We cannot separate the parts of the scripture. We have to take it as a whole. When you read this verse carefully, you'll see that focus and the core of the message not on hate, but is on what? Love. But since hate is such a harsh, strong word, we just get sucked into that. We just focus on, hey, we need to hate things. But the core of the message is to love. We are told love must be sincere and cling to what is good. So who is this command for and what is the message? Well, it's a message to the reader themselves. So if I'm reading it, this is what it's saying. June. Your love must be sincere. You must sincerely love. You must cling to what is good. Hate what's evil. In order for my love to be sincere, I must hate the evil in me and cling to that good that is in me. Understand? This command to evil is not to look for evil outside and say, hey, there's an evil guy right there. And hey, that guy's definitely going to go to hell. <laughs> That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about me. Your love must be sincere. You must hate the evil that's in you. So what's the evil in me? Well, it's the old sinful nature, right? It's our old nature to do what I think I want to do. I'm the absolute power. I'm the God of my life. 
What is the good in me? Is there any good in me? What does the Bible say about one who is good? It's God. When it says cling to the good that's in you, the real good that's in your heart is God. God gave you the deposit, right, of the Holy Spirit. Cling to that. Cling to the Holy Spirit. Cling to me. If you want your love to be sincere, you have to cling to me and hate your old self. Basically, that's what it's talking about. You are to hate your old self and cling to the Holy Spirit. I am commanded to be, what? Not tolerant, but hateful to the sin that's in me. You know, people, we live in this tolerant state. And what happens? We start tolerating our own sin. You know, we do something wrong and say, hey, that's okay, June. I mean, everybody tolerates that anyway. We don't even call that sin anymore. Well, you know, what are you, living in 18th century? You know those, those websites that you go to? Hey, it's not that bad. It's okay. Tolerate it. It's okay. God's going to forgive you no matter what. So what we're doing is we're conditioning ourselves to tolerate our own sin. To tolerate our own self. The scripture mentions hate. But the message is about love because the message in the Bible is always about love. As with last week, let's read the quote from Minister Arthur Leonard Griffith. Uh, following last week, we're going to read the second paragraph. He says this, Satan tempts us at the point of our ambition, not that we might engage in positive evil, but simply accept the fact of evil. Learn to live with it, come to terms with it, and maintain a discreet silence in the presence of it. As we close, I want all of you to be aware of this temptation of tolerance in this 21st century that we're living in. The temptation to accept evil and become content living with it. Being discreetly silent about it. I want to close with two main points and three prayer requests. First and foremost, beware of the temptation of tolerance in your life. You must not tolerate the evil that is in you. You must learn to cling to the goodness of God that God has deposited into your heart. When evil discreetly enters your thought, your imagination, and your heart, you must not tolerate it, but hate it and say no to it. Secondly, we are not to just tolerate others, but to love them. Love them with the love of Jesus Christ. You know, even in our youth group, if there's someone that you don't like or get along with, don't just tolerate them. Ah, that, there's that person again. And I put, he's probably not even a Christian. I don't know why he's coming to church. And you try to avoid them and you tolerate them. Uh, put up with them. That's not the Christian way. You are sinning. It might even exist in our own youth group. We don't have that many youth, but 25. In that group, if you don't like someone, you, you are not to tolerate, but make efforts to love that person. Spend time. Think about that person and pray about that person. God, I want to love that person more. How can I do it? And I'll guarantee you, God will show you a way. You will see things that in that him or her that you haven't seen before. Hey, this is how I could love this person. The three prayer requests that I for you for, for this week is this. One, I pray that none of you will tolerate anyone. Like I said, especially in our youth. But will love each other by showing interest, being nice, thinking about them, and praying about them.
Number two, I pray that all of you will cling to the goodness of God in your heart. How many of you are doing your guided QT diligently? I really ask you to do it. Because otherwise, there's no way you're going to be able to cling to the goodness that's in your heart. And if you're not clinging to the goodness, by default, what are you doing? Clinging to your old self. The evil that you're supposed to hate. You're clinging on to that. So you must make a positive effort to cling to the goodness that's in your heart. To cling to God. Number three. I pray that none of you will tolerate the evil, the sinfulness, the lust, the laziness, the pride, the jealousy, the rage, anger, hate that is in your heart. Everybody has one of these things or multiple things or all of these, in fact. One of the things that we do need to overcome is our, we need to have our self-control, right? Our parents talked about something, something comes up. Urgh. Mom, five more minutes, I told you. Urgh. Something just comes up. It's not like I'm trying to get it up from me. I don't have to try, it just comes up. Hate that. You have to catch it. Hey, I'm, that's my old self. I'm going to hate that. I'm going to cling to the new self and say, hey, mom, okay. Okay, God, you said that's bad. I'm not going to watch that. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to hate that person. I'm not going to be indifferent to that evil. Let's all close our eyes. Our Heavenly Father, we come before you, Lord. We are living in the society of tolerance, Lord. We are told to tolerate everything, everyone, and say everything's okay, including our sinfulness, Lord. And you say, no. You have to love sincerely. And in order for you to love sincerely, you must hate evil. Don't tolerate it. And you must cling to the goodness of me. And I pray that all of our youth will have such heart, Lord, that they would all have that dedication. I pray that if they don't get along with somebody in our youth, that they will go to you and say, God, my heart is full of this hate full of this evil, forgive me and help me to love that person. Show me the way. Give me the compassion, Lord. I pray that all of us will be awake, that we will not be asleep, just blindly following this world. But we will be awake in your love, with your heart of love, Lord. Thank you. And we pray all these things in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. God is great. Amen.